the, the, the glory of a seed is when it becomes a tree and it is able to bear fruit. Hallelujah. The glory of a human being, the glory of a human being, they have all fallen short and fallen from the glory of God. In other words, when you begin to walk with God, you begin to come into your glory. And even human being, there is a point where the glory has to appear to them. I will show you that. But I want to achieve first making this point understood. The glory of the glory of a church, it is when it goes to become exactly what God wants it to become. The glory of a, a male, the glory of a male is when it grows up to become you know a boy, he grows up to become a man, he grows up to become a father. Now he, when he becomes a father, he grows up to be able to start a family. Or he grows to be a man, he starts a family, becomes a father. So he has come into his glory. I hope you understand what I'm saying. In other words, he, have, he has lifted up everything, every potential that exists of living out. He has lifted out. The glory of a female is when she you know, moves from being a girl to moving to becoming a damsel or becoming a dame into becoming a lady, becoming a woman, getting married, becoming a wife, and then becoming a mother. There, there is nothing more to exploit except becoming a grandmother, which is still a mother. So everything has its own glory. The glory of an academic or, 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 or somebody that pursues education is when they are beginning to get PhD after PhD and there is nothing else that they need to get educated for. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Hallelujah. So everything has its own glory. Everything has its own glory. Now, generically speaking, the glory of a human being, the glory of a human being, it is not for a human being to appear. The glory of a human being is when a human being is able to achieve a point where something stronger than himself is able to, to, to flow inside of him. Please just touch the speaker behind. Just, just touch the cable of the speaker behind. So the glory of a human being is when there is something stronger than himself that he can live for. Now the Bible says, all have what? All have sinned. That word sin is not the word peneros as if to do wrong. It is the word haramat. It's a, it, haramat means to miss the mark. All have missed the mark. And by reason of having had missed the mark, they have fallen short of their glory. In other words, there is a benchmark for a man to be able to come to a place where he is able to allow the glory to flow through him. I hope you understand what I'm saying. There is something that you can do that can qualify for the glory of God to flow to you. And this thing, it, it can be done from person to person. This thing can be done from the person who's sitting next to you to the person who's sitting behind you to the person who's sitting in front of you. This thing can be done by that person. It's not something that is, you know, beyond certain people to do. It's not something that is allocated to certain human groups. No. It is something that is allocated to the human race. When everybody does this thing, there is something that we call glory, the SI unit of God. There is something that we call glory. The met glory is the measurement of God. God is beyond measure. The only way to measure him is to give him glory. Now, when a human being begins to walk upright according to the standard of the divine nature, he comes into glory. The glory of this young man that Jesus wanted to do something with him. Jesus said to this young man, this young man said, Rabbi, I've been rich for all my life. I have followed the Ten Commandments. What must I do? What else must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? Jesus says, sell all that you have and follow me. Now, Jesus was making him something stronger than just a normal Christian. When he says, follow me, the word follow me is disciple. He was giving him the same instruction as Peter. In other words, this young man, God wanted him to become more than rich. He wanted him to become an apostle. But he did not leave out the glory thereof. And so many of us here, there is something that God still wants to manifest and express in your life. Now, the Bible says this, the only way to come into your own glory, Romans chapter number 8, verse number 19, we read it. It says creation is waiting in travail. In other words, your circumstance is waiting in travail. Your situation is waiting in pain. It's waiting in mourning. In other words, 2023 is waiting for the manifestation of a mother that is seated here. It's waiting for a father that is able to cry out. It was 2023 where certain things that have never happened in your life, they must begin to happen. Certain things that could not be imagined with your life, they must begin to be imagined. Why? Because we are coming into a place of glory. Hallelujah. 
Now I need you to read one last verse and then we're gonna, you know, select among the glories and then we're gonna walk into the, in that stream. We're gonna go deep in that stream. There is a supply. I, I, I can taste the supply. There is a supply of an anointing to break open. The book of Colossians chapter 3 verse number 4, please. <laughs> Colossians 3, 4. Somebody, where is it? When Christ, who is our life, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear therefore therefore shall ye also appear with him in what in glory. so the bible says when christ who is our life shall appear then you shall also what appear the word appear is the word is the word manifest is the word manifest then you shall also manifest with him in glory in other words the full scope of man's manifestation is for men to give expression to the glory of christ in other words, until certain things have been done by Christ, you begin to walk in them. You begin to become a witness of those things. You have not yet given expression to the burden of God for your life. Say to somebody next to you, come to glory. Come to glory. Look for another one, say to that one, come to glory. Come to glory. Look for another one behind you, say come to glory. Come to glory. When God wants somebody to come into glory, God will create circumstances, situations that are necessary to press a person beyond what they are able to handle. Because gold must be taken through fire. The type of fire that copper is not able to handle. The type of fire that silver cannot be able to handle. And the fire that is causing copper to evaporate, silver to evaporate, it is the fire that causes gold to be purified. So what causes others to disappear, to come out of existence? What causes others who are just on survival mode to just begin to disappear? It is actually there to purify you if you understand your capacity. Now the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse number 20, it says in a great house, like, like we are gathered here, in a great house there are different vessels. There is a vessel of gold, there is a vessel of silver, there is a vessel of copper, there is a vessel of wood, there is a vessel of clay. Now you need to first select what vessel are you. If you understand your circumstances that these ones other people were not able to bear, you understand that you automatically you cannot be wood. Because, because there's a place where wood burns, where gold feels nothing, where gold is not even purified. So there is something that you need to begin to ask you, what, what, what vessel am I? What is God trying to achieve for my life? Why have I faced all these situations that I've been faced with? What is God trying to achieve? Once you begin to understand what God is trying to achieve, you are going to begin to press into that reality. Now I want you to speak here. There are people that God has said to me is going to elevate financially. Yes, this is not a prosperity message. This is the emphasis of the burden of God. You know, how can God only speak on water? How can he not speak to the ground? There are people that God has an appointment here to elevate, to break the yokes of their finances. And, and some of us, we do not understand how to manifest. That's why our trust in God and our work in God when it comes to these things is, is not upright. So I want to try to make the work upright, establish the work of God, and then from there bring the emphasis of the burden of God and then release certain people into their destiny. Hallelujah. The book of First Timothy, please. First Timothy. First Timothy chapter number 5, verse number 8. There is something that God is trying to achieve. Yes, yes. Say to somebody, there is something that God is trying to achieve to me. Mm, mm. I, I just need you to, to, to be here for a little while. Hallelujah. Are you there? Alright, can I get somebody to read? First Timothy chapter 5, verse number 8. First Timothy chapter 5, verse number 8. First Timothy chapter 5, verse number 8. Somebody. But but if anyone uh, now these are the precepts. Remember, we read a verse about the precepts of God. God has knowledge, God has understanding. There is something that God wants to achieve. He says, Here is the first precept in order to be able to cause men to walk before him upright. Uh -huh. He says what? But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those for of his household he has denied the faith, has denied the faith. and he is worse than an unbeliever now allow me to establish scriptural accuracy because from one transition to the next transition the emphasis 
of the text is being compromised and the standard of the culture from the writing of the text is becoming compromised. Apostle Paul was one such that when he writes, you write to a body of others. Are you following me? So the, the proper translation does not say if anyone. It says if any man does not provide for himself and that of his own household. He is worse than a non-believer and he has denied the faith. So I want to establish something here. And then we are going to graduate after this thing into something else. Okay. Number one. The word man or the word father is a Greek word pater. That's why you would say paternity test. Hallelujah. And this word pater, it, it forms the word patria. Please say patria. And the word patria is the word family. In other words, you must hear what I'm saying. You must hear what I'm saying. Mother is the word is the word mater, maternity. When a woman gets married, they are saying it's matrimony. In other words, matrimony is a combination of two things: is the word matri or the word mata, and nomi, which is the word you know ceremony. In other words, it's a ceremony of taking a woman from one family into another family. I want to bring the burden of God. If you are a woman and you are married here, I'm speaking to you. Now, I cannot speak to you looking in, in your eyes because you are too many. Every woman that gets married, according to the grounds of the scripture and according to the emphasis of the mind of the writers of the text, every woman that gets married must be translated from one house to what? To the next house. And the way to establishing that, it is the changing of the surname. If the woman has not changed the surname, the woman is not translated. I don't care how, how much you are used to that family. The woman is not translated. If the woman has two surnames, she is not translated. I don't care how much she's, she, she loves this family. She has not been translated. Because that stroke, that hyphenation in the Hebrew, it means that the person is still connected to two sources. So that is the word matrimony. So when somebody gets married, they move from one house to the next house. I hope you understand what I'm saying from one family to the next family because the father will bring you until somewhere on the altar when he brings you until somewhere on the altar in other systems they will put a stick there and then the husband will take you from there and take you to the altar and on the altar there is no stick there so when the father brings you there he says i have done everything this is my limitation the stick represents a yoke a yoke is a is a is a synonym or it's you know it's synonymous with with responsibility. I have done everything in the realm of responsibility to bring you until here. This man is supposed to take you, but now we have a problem. He, he, when he takes you, establish, he brings you to the altar, but there is no stick. In other words, this man is going to take responsibility until. Until. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm establishing something here. So the, the primary responsibility of a woman is to understand the concept. To understand that function, to understand that machine. Hallelujah. And the primary responsibility of the man is to understand that the word husband is not lover. Jesus. The word husband is not what? This is why when a woman gets married and she finds somebody that she loves, she gets frustrated. Because the husband is not a lover. There are three, three ways of using the word husband. Number one, is when you are using it in the animal kingdom when you say i'm husbanding this animal in other words i'm cultivating i'm raising i'm bringing the best up of this animal number two when you use it according to the way it is we used in the book of john chapter 15 verse 1 my father I, I am the vineyard and my father is the husband man you know what is the husband man is the one that comes to prune, the one that comes to cut so many women men will be saying i don't like this thing I don't like the way you are behaving like this. I think you must fix this thing. She will not understand why is this man behaving like this. This man is a husband man. Amen. This man has a responsibility to shape character, to shape intelligence. He has a responsibility to form a house. So well, part of husbanding is pruning, is cutting, is shaping, is giving form. It's adjusting certain things that are not proper. We are going to number three, husband. So husband becomes now a spouse. So I have already unveiled three things. Number one is the one that cultivates you. The one that brings the best out of you. 
Number two, it is the one that takes responsibility of pruning you, of shaping you, of cutting you. That's why husbands function like fathers. Mm, you didn't get that one. Amen. That's why husbands function like fathers. They function like fathers. Yes. A husband must qualify first to be a father before he qualifies to be a husband. Because the first person he's going to father is the wife. Amen. And then be, then become when he has cultivated and brought the best out of you, he brings you to a level where he raises you to be his equal. Until a husband qualifies to a place where he raises his wife to become his equal, where he does not look at her and say, ah, but this is a property. He does not look at her and say, but this one is not able to be this. Until he raises her to a place where she is an equal, she can give expression to the same Christ, to the same ways. And the man has lost his purpose. But that's not where I'm going. I'm going to this verse. So the Bible says, except a man is first able to do what? Provide for himself. Provide for himself. Provide for himself. And for that of his household, he has denied the faith. In other words, if we don't go to a standard financially as the body of Christ, where you are able to take care of yourself and be able to take care of your household, as a man, we are at the back stretch of being able to make anything. Hallelujah. The first educational structure is the house. The first cultural structure is the house. Let me put it this way. The strongest prison that is required in society is not the one where people are at today. Every person that is in a prison, no matter how strong it is, no matter how locked they are, they are not locked. They are not quarantined. They are not. The strongest person must, the strongest prison must be the father. Because the father will be saying, no, you don't do this. You do it this way. He brings about restrictions that are invincible, but that are stronger than, than iron. That are stronger than iron bars. That are stronger than brass. That are stronger than bronze. And that is what is required to begin to shape the house into them. That's what I'm going. If any man is not able to provide, say provide. 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 So, so once you lose capacity to provide, once you lose ability to provide, the Bible says you have denied the faith. How many of us that are seated here, we have denied the faith already? Speaking in tongues, Kaprosa, let that do stuff, but you have denied the faith. The Bible says, you must learn how to provide so that you must not deny the faith. Hallelujah. A lack of ability to provide means you have denied the faith. And so, our people, we, we cannot hold back. We have to preach a kind of message where people can be elevated to a place where they are able to provide. They are able to provide. They are able to provide. 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 There are laws that govern provision. There are laws that govern provision in the kingdom of God. I would like you to go to one of the laws. Hallelujah. Amen. Law number one. Law number one. The book of Psalms 23 verse number one. Please if you can. Psalms 23 verse number one. Please read. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in the green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He maketh me to lie down in the green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He maketh me to lie down in the green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He maketh me to lie down in the green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He maketh me to lie down in the green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He maketh me to lie down in the green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He maketh me to lie down in the green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He maketh me to lie down in the I want to quickly show you what the duty of a pastor is. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not need. What is the duty of a pastor? Ephesians 4.12 the, the perfecting of the saints. So when God is your shepherd, what does he do? Number one, he perfects you. So the first purpose of God in your life, when it comes to finances, is for him to perfect you. Number two. For the work of ministry. God is to look for an area where you can serve. He has to train you, release you in an area where you can serve. Read. For the edifying. So God has to edify you. He has to build you up. Uh-huh. Are you seeing that? 
So when God has perfected you, when God has released you for your ministry, and God has what edified you, what happens is you lack dice. The more you walk in the call of God, lack dice. Lack, lack dice. One thing dies, needs die. You come to a place where you cannot conceptualize what you need. Not because there are no needs, but because the burden of God is so strong for God to keep you functioning in your perfection, functioning in your edification, functioning in your ministry. He has to provide for what? The needs. Needs, needs, needs. Needs are simple. Needs are what we call the basics of life. Hallelujah. So the emphasis of God in your life is to provide for the basics of life. But this is concept. This is precept I'm giving you. The first thing that God has an interest to achieve in your life is to provide for what? For the needs of life. Needs. 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 Now there is a structure through which he provides for these needs. Help us Jesus. Help us. Philippians chapter 4 verse number 19. The book of Philippians please if you can. Chapter number 4, verse number 19. There is a structure that God uses to provide for the needs of the body of Christ. Help us, Lord. Are you there? Please read if you are there. And my God, and my God, and my God, and my God shall what? Shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now, this is a building case. The legal conduit through which God provides for your needs it is in the riches of the glory of Christ Jesus. But when we read in the book of Romans chapter number 3 verse number 23, it says all have fallen short of the glory of God. In other words, when you begin to rise in the glory of God, you begin to encounter supernatural provision and the bible says colossians 3 4 that when christ shall appear we shall appear with him in glory in other words once you begin to allow christ to appear to you his glory is given expression in other words the more you give expression to the glory of god in your life the more God is able to unlock this. For I know that my God is able to do what? To provide from, for your needs according to his riches in glory. In other words, the more the dimensions of the glory of God, they become visible in your life, the more God is able to provide. Shall provide for me. Provide mm, Please say it like you just didn't sleep last night. Shall provide for me. Shall, shall, shall the Lord provide? Lord provide. So one of the things we must first experience before the provision is the supernatural touch of the glory of God. When the glory of God comes supernaturally upon you, it has the capacity, it has the, the intensity, it has the tenacity to break what frustrates your life. Mm, what we need to do is we need to ask God to give expression to his glory. God, give expression to your glory. Give expression to your glory. I've been in this place for way too long. Give expression to your glory. When the glory of God comes upon a person, I don't care what their need is. God supernaturally provides for their needs. Mm, he supernaturally provides. I want to take you to the second phase of the message. But before I take you there, I want us to do prayer.